Chapter One of The Spring of Joy, a Little Book of Healing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Spring of Joy by Mary Webb. This Medicatrix Naturae. We live the life of plants, the life of animals, the life of men, and at last the life of spirits. Sir Thomas Brown On some day of late January, when the honey-coloured west is full of soft grey cloud, when one lone minstrel thrush is chanting to the dying light, what is the thrill that shakes us? It is not only that the delicate traceries of silver birches are tenderly dark on the illuminated sky, that a star springs out of it like darting quicksilver, that the music of tone and tint has echoed last April's song. It is something deeper than these. It is the sudden sense, keen and startling, of oneness with all beauty, seen and unseen. This sense is so misted over that it only comes clearly at such times. When it does come, we are in complete communion with the universal life. The winds are our playfellows, Sirius is our fellow traveller, we are swept up into the wild heart of the wild. Then we know that we are not merely built up physically out of flower, feather and light, but are one with them in every fibre of our being. Then only do we have our full share in the passion of life that fills all nature. Then only do we possess perfect vitality. Then we are caught into the primal beauty of earth, and life flows in upon us like an eiger. Life, the unknown quantity, the guarded secret, circles from an infinite ocean through all created things and turns again to the ocean. This miracle that we eternally question and desire and adore dwells in the comet, in the heart of a bird and the flying dust of pollen. It glows upon us from the blazing sun and from a little bush of broom, unveiled and yet mysterious, guarded only by its own light, more impenetrable than darkness. The power of this life, if men will open their hearts to it, will heal them, will create them anew, physically and spiritually. Here is the gospel of earth, ringing with hope, like May mornings with birdsong fresh and healthy as fields of young grain, but those who would be healed must absorb it not only into their bodies in daily food and warmth, but into their minds, because its spiritual power is more intense. It is not reasonable to suppose that an essence so divine and mysterious as life can be confined to material things. Therefore, if our bodies need to be in touch with it, so do our minds. The joy of a spring day revives a man's spirit, reacting healthily on the bone and blood, just as the wholesome juices of plants cleanse the body, reacting on the mind. Let us join in the abundant sacrament, for our bodies the crushed gold of harvest and ripe vine clusters, for our souls the purple fruit of evening with its innumerable seed of stars. We need no great gifts. The most ignorant of us can draw deep breaths of inspiration from the soil. The way is through love of beauty and reality, and through absorbed preoccupation with those signs of divinity that are like faint, miraculous footprints across the world. We need no passports in the Freemasonry of earth as we do in the company of men. The only indispensable gifts or a humble mind and a receptive heart. We must go softly if we desire the butterfly's confidence. We must walk humbly if we dare to ask for an interpretation of this dream of God. 
no accident of environment or circumstance need cut us off from nature her spirit stirs the flowers in a town window box looks up from the eyes of a dog sounds in the chirp of grimy city sparrows from an observation hive in a london flat the bee passes out with the same dumb and unfathomable instinct that drove her from her home on hybla of old we may pry into her daily life but her inmost secrets are as inviolable and as fascinating to us as they were to virgil watching from the beech tree shade it does not matter how shut in we are opportunity for wide experience is of small account in this as in other things it is depth that brings understanding and life dawn seen through a sick woman's window however narrow pulses with the same fresh wonder as it does over the whole width of the sea a branch of flushed wild apple brings the same joy as the mauve trumpet flower of the tropics one violet is as sweet as an acre of them and it often happens as if by a kindly law of compensation that those who only have one violet find the way through its narrow purple gate into the land of god while many who walk over dewy carpets of them do not so much as know that there is a land or a way the primal instincts can seldom be so dead that no pleasure or kinship wakens at the thronging of these vivid colours and mysterious sounds here is a kingdom of wonder and of secrecy into which we can step at will where dwell nations whose very language is for ever unknown to us whose laws are not our laws yet with whom we have a bond for we are another expression of the life that created them here we find beauty that takes away the breath romance that tingles to the fingertips we think that there is some deep meaning in it all if we could only find it sometimes we catch an echo of it in a plover's cry in the silence before a storm so we listen hearing a faint call from afar it is this sense of mystery unfading because the veil is never lifted that gives glory to the countryside tenderness to atmosphere it is this that sends one man to the wilds another to dig a garden that sings in a musician's brain that inspires the pagan to build an altar and the child to make a cowslip ball for in each of us is implanted the triune capacity for loving his fellow and nature and the creator of them these loves may be latent but they are there and unless they are all developed we cannot reach perfect manhood or womanhood for the complete character is that which is in communion with most sides of life which sees hears and feels most which has for its fellows the sympathy of understanding for nature the love that is without entire comprehension and for the mystery beyond them the inexhaustible desire which surely prophesies fulfilment somewhere earth is not only the mother of the young the strong the magnificent whose tired muscles and long-limbed grace are the embodiment of her physical life in whose eager glance burns the vitality of her spirit she is also the pitiful mother of those who have lost all she will sing lullabies to them instead of battle songs she will pour her life into them through long blue days and silver nights she will give back the mirth and beauty that have slipped through their fingers when participation in man's keen life is denied it is not strange if laughter dies in the sirocco of pain it is not surprising if joy and faith are carried away so many sit by the wayside begging unconscious that the great giver is continually passing down the highways and hedges of nature where each weed is wonderful so many are blind and hopeless yet they have only to desire vision 
and they will see that through his coming the thickets are quickened into leaf and touched with glory out in this world the spirit that was so desolate lost in the strange atmosphere of physical inferiority may once more feel the zest that he thought was gone for ever and this zest is health sweeping into the mind and into those recesses of being beyond the conscious self it overflows into the body very often this great rush of joy this drinking of the freshets of the divine brings back perfect health even in diseases that are at present called incurable and that are purely physical no one will deny the immense alleviation resulting from this new life it is possible that as the spiritual ties between man and nature grow stronger all disease may vanish before the vitality that will stream into us so swiftly so easily because it will not be confined to one channel a man who holds direct intercourse with the cosmic life through his heart and mind knows a glad comradeship with cloud and tree there dwells within him a consciousness surrounding splendour of swift currents marvels underfoot and overhead he has a purpose in waking each morning a reason for existing he clings to the beauty of earth as to a garment and he feels that the wearer of the garment is god beauty and joy and laughter are necessities of our being and nature brims with them there are some things that always bring joy a ripple of song in winter the blue flash of a kingfisher downstream a subtle scent that startles and waylays the coming of spring brings it the first crocus pricking up dawn a moment earlier day by day the mist of green on honeysuckle hedges in february the early arabis spicy warm with the bees hum about it the flawless days of may bring it when big white clouds sail leisurely over the sky when the burning bush is in the height of its beauty and white lilac is out and purple lilac is breaking from the bud and chestnut spires are lengthening and the hawthorn will not be long out in the fresh green world where thrushes sing so madly the sweets of the morning are waiting to be gathered more than enough for all low at our feet higher than we can reach wide enough even for the travelling soul joy rushes in with the rain-washed air when you fling the window wide to the dawn and lean out into the clear purity before the light listening to the early chuck chuck of the blackbird watching the pulse of colour beat higher in the east joy is your talisman when you slip out from the sleeping house down wet and gleaming paths into the fields where dense canopies of cobwebs are lightly swung from blade to blade of grass then the air is full of wings birds fly in and out of the trees scattering showers of raindrops as they dash from a leafy chestnut or disappear among the inner fastnesses of a fir pinions of dark and pinions of day share the sky and over all are the brooding wings of unknown presences the east burns the hearts of the birds flame into music the wild singing rises in swelling rhythm until as the first long line of light creeps across the meadows the surging chorus seems to shake the treetops laughter need not be lost on those that are cut off from their fellows the little creatures of earth are the court jesters of all that dwell in the hall of sorrow and although more insight and love are needed to enjoy their subtle humour than to enjoy our own we have an ample reward of unfailing and spontaneous laughter as vicarious grief is the keenest of all so is vicarious laughter any one who has watched the farcical solemnities of a rookery the carefully thought-out inanities of wagtails the drunken decorum of bees in full honey flow will not mind being cut off from human gatherings where the laughter is sometimes a little mirthless 
any one who has pondered on the ways of the meadow ant that influential dairy farmer with her prosperous herds of aphids cared for with the same transparently self-interested devotion as the cottager's pig and on the mind of the aphis which allows itself to be milked and driven with such cow-like placidity and on the hill ants who surreptitiously milk each other's cows need never be dull there are many to whom all beauty seems denied they hunger for it dumbly unconsciously is their life to be a stricken tree colourless and silent surely not it may be all illuminated like a sombre pine at the advent of wood pigeons when there are low contented croonings instead of silence soft iridescent breasts against the harsh spines widespread opal wings irradiating the tree the flawless forms and colours of nature are an especial consolation to those who are oppressed by that dark tragedy deformity of body or unloveliness of face how deep is the desolation when a sad soul looks out anxiously through eyes that cannot reflect its beauty watching for an answering smile and meeting only a look of swiftly concealed repulsion startled and ill at ease in the ruinous mortal dwelling reminded of it continually this soul leads a life of torture i saw one of these look from her windows and weep bitterly finding no comfort then a voice came in the long sigh of the dawn breeze i know inhabitant of eternity how straight and comfortless your home is go out into my garden and forget the skies are clear see where i lead out my sidereal flocks the tall young larches are dreaming of green there is moonlight in the primrose woods there is a fit dwelling for you go and be at peace she rose and went and her laugh came back upon the wind the leaves do not hesitate to finger and kiss any face however marred that looks up into their dwelling no distortion of body frightens the birds if the heart within loves them one flower of germander speedwell may be the magic robe that clothes us with the beauty of earth as the maiden found her bridal garment in the fairy nut so we may find in the folded speedwell bud glimmering raiment to cover our homespun it has the same strength of structure wonder of tint and mystery of shadow as all natural things awakened by its minute perfection the mind travels softly away through checkered woods over the swinging sea to mountains gleaming like a medieval paradise forests of sumac lakes of pink and blue lilies returning as from a trance weary with splendour it realises that nature's beauty can never be perfectly grasped yet since in essence it is the same wherever a blade of grass appears or a bird's shadow passes over since the fact of seeing it in whatever degree is the precious thing let us go out along the lovely ways that lead from our doors into the heart of enchantment ceasing for a time to question and strive let us dare to be merely receptive stepping lightly over the dewy meadows brushing no blue dust from the butterfly's wing then if life is suddenly simplified by the removal of all that we hold most dear we shall know the way to other things not less precious we shall know of long green vistas carpeted with speedwell ascending to a place of comfort and the blue butterfly will lead us into peace these three joy laughter and beauty are the broadest riverways down which may flow the essential life which itself is health and youth beyond thought beyond time a sea that fills eternity yet nearer than the air we breathe imminent in the humblest creature making material things transparent as a beech leaf in the sun and because those who most need its influx have only the least of earth's graces to watch 
this book is concerned with muted skies minute miracles songs of the night and the proud humility of the germ that holds in its littleness the lord of immortality end of chapter one chapter two part one of the spring of joy by mary webb this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Joy, Part One, the joy of motion. My free soul may use her wing, George Herbert. The white grass root, only a little blinder than the mole, a little less purposeful than the worm goes softly about her dark house cares in the close chambers where no wind comes and sends out her sons with banners when no breeze brushes the grass we can very nearly see the multitudinous upward movement of the blades as they slip into the light in their ardent resurrection when the trees are dumb on summer noons we can almost hear the sap run when no tread of man or beast disturbs the silence we are haunted by the footsteps of the dust of all those atoms that move invisibly and mysteriously to fresh unions for the building of hills and the hollowing of valleys on such a day all the ripples of motion are in full flow the tide of growth is coming in all green things and flowers hold out their arms to the sun in autumn the tide ebbs leaf and petal look down to the soil whence they came as if they heard a call and longed to go back and intermingle with their kin softly the petal flings herself down and the leaf is not long in following they go not to death but to a new incarnation among the unseen company that moves in silence busier than a hive creating daily a wonder greater than any myth the world around us with its mutable grace the story of any flower is not one of stillness but of faint gradations of movement that we cannot see the widening and lengthening of petals the furling and unfurling of leaves are too gentle for our uneducated eyes the white convolvulus that flowers only for a day meets the early light folded as if with careful fingers and dusk finds it folded in almost the same way you would think that the stillness had never been broken yet between dawn and twilight the flower's life work has been completed in one series of smooth delicate motions the hour of the pointed bud has been followed by hours of change until the time of the open blossom and the feeding bee and even in that triumphant moment a faint tremor shook the spread corolla and the final silent furling had begun during the whole drama the flower has seemed stationary like many spirits that grow from sheath to bud open golden treasure and close again before our eyes and we never see watch a bank of periwinkle on an early summer morning the fresh blue flowers are poised high on delicate stalks and seem aloof from the leaves absolute stillness broods over them no tremor is discernible in leaf or petal the wide blue flowers gaze up intently into the wide blue sky suddenly without any breath of wind without so much stir as a passing gnat makes one flower has left her stem no decay touched her it was just that in her gentle progressive existence the time for erect receiving was over some faint vibration told her that the moment had come for her to leave off gazing stilly at the sky and so in silence and beauty with soft precipitation she buried her face in the enfolding evergreen leaves this pale shadow of a gesture is as lovely as inevitable as the flight of wild swans beating up the sky 
in a glade carpeted with wood sorrel just before rain you will be aware of something going on down among the frail companies of leaves returning after an absence of half an hour you will see a difference in the look of every plant each triplet of leaflets has softly crinkled towards the stalk umbrella wise and in another half hour they will be all tightly clasped round it it is startling to see such steady purpose in so small a plant evening after evening in the summer i have gone to see the white clover fall asleep in the meadows kneeling and looking very closely as the dew begins to gather one sees a slight change in the leaves all round the green is paler than by day when the dark upper surfaces of the leaves are flat beneath the flowers because the pale undersides are now visible as the light fails the two lower leaves on each stalk gently approach one another like little hands that were going to clap but thought better of it and at last lie folded quietly as if for prayer then the upper leaf droops as a child's face might until it rests on the others everywhere in the dusk the white clover leaves are sleeping in an attitude of worship those who are early enough may see them wake and rise in the morning multitudes moving in slow unfaltering unity unlike the clover the wood sorrel and the ivy leaf toad flax move with sudden violence the capsule of wood sorrel opens with a jerk flinging the seeds a long way in a seemingly erratic manner the toad flax gives an impression of deliberate thought by the way its seed vessel turns round on the stalk seeking a suitable crevice on the wall where it grows and then dropping the seeds in it is difficult to distinguish the separate movements because the flowers are small and crowded and do not ripen altogether the thought of this underlying agitation gives mystery to the more perceptible motions caused by the elements one of the most captivating of these is the ripple of corn it is so swift so elusive that the eye cannot follow it it is a sea dream to stand on a little hill and watch the whole countryside in delicious motion furrowed by the invisible racing shallops of the breezes the waves wash and break upon the flowery hedges and the remote horizon and seem ready to submerge everything in their foamless flood all solid things are made less solid by motion so grass looks liquid trees have an aerial magic when the wind is in them in summer the willows stroke the smooth water with their long fingers the supple branches droop till they dip in the stream and as they sway every thin leaf is followed by a vanishing hollow one of the daintiest joys of spring is the falling of soft rain among blossoms the shining and apparently weightless drops come pattering into the may tree with a sound of soft laughter one alights on a white petal with a little inaudible tap then petal and raindrop fall together down the steep of green and white accompanied by troops of other petals each with her attendant drop and her passing breath of scent the leaves sit still and laugh for they know that their time has not come and the drops slide off shamefacedly and go elsewhere the young buds laugh in their high places strong in their immaturity and all day the rain laughs among the thin curved petals till the descending drops are like silver wires from the treetop to the grass and the petals slip down them like white beads how different from the spring lyric is the epic of autumn a west wind in the wood the leaves have lost their individuality like a multitude of people on some calamitous day wild and reckless companies fly down the rides beech and hornbeam elm ash and sycamore in strangely assorted crowds no longer in demure families each on its own tree the sound of their hurrying feet comes near then with wild unreason they turn desperately flying from the invisible 
before the old west wind that blows from the sunset the wise wind that knew the atlantic before a ship was on it the strong wind that maddens the sea-horses it is no wonder that the leaves are afraid the very trees are bending double before it groaning in the agony of their defiance the lithe little birches sweep to earth in an ecstasy of surrender the fir trees lash themselves the saplings have learnt obedience their slender elasticity is at the wind's will only the stiff old oaks and elms refuse to yield and ominous crashes tell of their struggle the live creatures of the wood have hidden from the tumult the most living things in the place are the leaves with their scurrying feet and their complaining whispering voices they are like an elfin nation a lost tribe a defeated army that has forgotten discipline the sight and the sound of this world-old conflict brings the same strong exhilaration as music does when it quickens and deepens to a climax what new and romantic discoveries await the explorer in the pilgrimages of animals mysterious journeyings of fox badger weasel and rat the nomadism of frogs and eels migrations of those water swallows the trout ocean wanderings of the oleander hawk moth who for all her frailty will venture hundreds of miles from land these movements of which we know so little are not mere restlessness but planned and ordered comings and goings we often have one glimpse of them a weasel runs across a lane from spinney to spinney a water rat scurries past upon an unknown errand a rabbit comes up from his hole upon pressing business and scampers off into obscurity or a shy little field mouse creeps from her nest and goes back in a flurry most of us have come to be content with this for not many have the unique qualities necessary for watching the free and secret lives of wild creatures it is even more difficult to be intimate with birds for with a flash of wings they are gone in an instant beyond all clues with migratory birds especially mystery is the chief part of the story all summer you watch a pair of swallows you seem to be getting to know them to be nearer their secret then a day comes when the aspens are beginning to be flecked with gold long sprays of yellow tansy sweep the water and in the hearts of the fruited elder bushes are faint twitterings and gentle flutterings looking down into the golden tints of stream you see far within it the shadows of your swallows remote and vague as if the mist of distance had already descended between you and them and you know that soon they will be only birds of memory mere flashes of the past instead of the intimate little friends of your summer days you can never know to what sun-baked cornice what warm blue pool or purple fruited tree they went on those swift wings of theirs the passage of two birds across the sky appeals indescribably to the imagination they come from the farthest horizon flying swiftly high in the blue pursuing their intent way and vanishing you know not whither they go to some far trysting place some nest that is to be in willow or darkling fir some place that their ancestors have known and we are left with a memory of wings dividing the air and a sense of frustration the coming of a dipper upstream is worth watching for all a summer's day suddenly at a far bend in the green dimness of overarching trees there is a flash of white like a fairy shield it comes on steadfastly through shadow and sunlight with a smooth and gliding motion growing larger and larger until the last bright piece of water is traversed on still outspread wings and the bird alights gently on the stone few things are more stimulating than the sight of the forceful wings of large birds cleaving the vagueness of air and making the piled clouds a mere background for their concentrated life the peregrine falcon becalmed in the blue depths 
cruises across space without a tremor of his wide wings wild geese beat up the sky in a compact wedge primeval forces in their strongly moving wings and their beautiful outstretched necks in their powerful untiring effort and the eager search of their wild hearts for the free spaces they love the good fellowship of swift united action the joy of ten thousand that move as one is in the flight of flocks of birds when seagulls flash up from the water with every wing at full stretch there is no deliberation it is as if each bird saw a sweeping arc before it and followed its individual way faithfully the unerring judgment of the grand curve where the wings are so near and yet never collide the speed of the descent of pure poetry in the dipping flight of little birds such as sparrows linnets and tits there is something reminiscent of cup and ball a very light ball in a very large cup the bird sinks in the air and is gently tossed up again dipping continually yet it flies with arrowy speed the enthusiasm of the process the buoyancy of the little thing which can afford to spend so much more strength than it needs make it an incarnation of youth and gaiety in spring the wood pigeon forgets fleet-winged adventure and flutters tethered for he has a treasure then too the greenfinch is overtaken by happy languor and falters in her flight smitten with the april madness bees wings moving give a sense of absolute ease because the energy seems so great in proportion to the frail weight lifted it is restful to watch these creatures so ethereal of body so abundantly gifted with vitality young gnats the daintiest of dancers ephemeral and swift with their tireless measure hive bees standing around their doors on a hot day their thin airy wings flickering fast making a cool stir with their noiseless rhythm even the great door beetles and fluffy bumblebees those angry people of the fields fling their stout bodies through the air with a careless ease that implies immense reserves of power the dragonfly fiery with purposeful energy flashes over the stream in some long quest like palomides those small electric blue insects that make a haze over water meadows in june continue their innumerable dartings briskly in the most swooning heat but there is nothing brisk in the opening and folding of a butterfly's wing they are softly and weightlessly sleepy she comes along the golden day with her faint continual flutter her wings make a gentle vibration in the air from far down the stretches of ripe brown grass meadow you watch her approach and because of her the place becomes elysium the white moth's passing is a lullaby her wings have the elusiveness of dreams as she flickers down the dusk and alights contentedly upon the opening campion movements of which we become conscious through one sense alone brings a strange feeling of secrecy owl's flight and all other motions of which we should know nothing with our eyes shut have an eeriness because of this purposeful quiet it is uncanny that the strength of those swooping wings should be so utterly noiseless in a lightning flash coming in the deep hush after thunder lies terror such unthinkably swift and formless motion instantaneously bridging the abyss of space without a sound is like some fearful portent are our senses undeveloped since the dramas of dawn and moonrise have for us no chorus the wind steals by invisible the stars go through their stately ritual with silent tread weaving their radiant dances to no murmur of music unseen activity hints of imminent ungaged power isaiah's idea of communion with the deity was clothed in terms expressing invisible motion 
any stir of life is ominous if we cannot see it because we are left uncertain as to the strength behind it rustling in a wood on a moonless night may be caused by slight or overwhelming forces so it is with the wind that bodiless voice crying in the great spaces of the air shouting round our roofs and chimneys sighing at our windows yelling above the passion of a storm at sea fluting in the summer treetops it is like a whisper in the night when you cannot tell whether a child or a man is speaking like some creature flapping at our doors in the gloom we never see the gates of its dark house swing open nor watch it fall beyond the waters into its tomb beneath the yellow sunset every day since the earth was the wind has sighed and sung around it gathering up the laughter and tears of all creatures and taking them into its ageless liberty more mysterious than the invisible wind is the wind that is simply felt blowing where there are no trees in which to watch it pressing upon one with tireless invincible force there are few things that bring such awe and delight for it is stronger than a thousand strong horses shadowless and secret as a god nature sets her dance to every rhythm from slow undulations to the swift dangerous rushes that bring wild exhilaration the long pendulum swing of trees is restful not in the unambitious manner of quiescence that might mean death nor with a sudden cessation of movement that might mean injury but with the content of a return after swaying out from a fixed place which implies balance and vitality in the same way a poised mind sweeps out to all new ideas but is not torn from its place because of its roots in this world of swinging swaying cleaving fluttering motion what is the part of the man who is obliged to be still it is in his eager mind looking from the drowsy room which is the world of his body into the stirring life outside he who longs for the gay kindliness of comradely exertion can project himself into the glad errantries of nature he can gallop on the wild horses of wave and wind outspanning his team in the caravanserai of night he can pass with the stars on their long marches he can peer through the soil with growing grass and slip in and out of wet spring coverts with nesting birds as the doors into physical busyness are shut more may be opened into the lusty activities of the spirit and through these doors are vistas of fresh joy it overflows the very sills like ground ivy those who have complete bodily freedom will probably never enter fully into the deep happiness brought by waving grass and running water but he who has time and who cares to use his imagination can see in all natural things the bowing down of the creature before the creator perhaps a young larch grows near his window and he loves the strong elastic swing of the branches or he may have a company of lombardy poplars to watch and can see them when he lies awake on a windy night catching the stars in their green meshes with a sweep like that of a butterfly net possibly he can see nothing but sky then he can observe uninterruptedly the speed of grey marsh clouds before their sheepdog the gale the shepherding of white midsummer flocks towards evening the massing of them for thunder the advent of the first star the swimming rose of dawn passing up the sky the sun's progress in lonely majesty through the great hollow heaven of summer will mean more to him than to other people a watcher of the melodic ritual of earth cannot know stagnation of soul his ideas are fresh and vigorous although the healthy quickening of the pulse after exertion the joy of hard work may be denied to a man adventures of the soul are his along the way that no fowl knoweth who can say that such enterprises of an eager spirit may not be nearer to real life the life of the unknown forces that hold the wandering star and guide the travelling moon 
than are the more comprehensible adventures of the body a gift was given to brother bernard of quinta valle to wit that he fled flying like the swallows end of chapter two part one chapter two part two of the spring of joy by mary webb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian joy part two the joy of music eftsoons they heard a most melodious sound spencer the music of nature vocal and orchestral laughs and sobs through the seasons with eternal variations ominous reassuring triumphant tender it swells across the world and across the ages in majestic diapason and is suddenly hushed for the humble solo of a robin the composition is so large and intricate that we cannot discern the thread of the melody nor the idea beneath the music sometimes we distinguish a few chords even a bar or two but our grasp is too small and our life too short to attain any continuous consciousness of its development we are like people who come into an opera house and hear a snatch of some bridal song or a stave of the pilgrim's chorus and then are called away occasionally some of the detached sounds weave themselves into an air i have heard rain on leaves the lowing of cattle and the shrill song of a gnat unite in this way but as a rule we have to be content with scattered and lonely notes like one who knows some distant music only through the floating echo of a flute the far sweet quiver of a violin this music has for treble the faint cheeping of little birds the falling of a seed the flow of sap for bass the loud utterances of the sea the passion and melancholy of the winds some notes bring more joy than others perhaps because they mean more when the first thrush sings between january snowstorms with such appealing charm he is chanting the recitative that leads on the great spring chorus something like his must have been the song of the first bird on the earliest budding tree when the world was young akin to it may be the song of some early waking spirit and who can say that spirits shall not awake like the scarlet moth from her chrysalis the golden bird from her egg beginning falteringly the music that will be taken up like the chant of a dawn blackbird by the gathering glee men how the thrush sings in april on the high yew bough you may stand close to his tree and watch his bright throat quiver he is so absorbed that he never hears a footstep how thrillingly he pleads come hither love come here come here to me now 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 come to the yew tree bough sweet dear sweet dear mine mine come or i come to you 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 come here come here to me he sings in the air as he flies he sings on the ground he is afire with song among the pale green elm samaras the blackbird sits alone and out of his long brooding weaves a strong enchantment he sings falls in his effortless way from the green height to the green depth and sings again now in every country place the birds translate their happiness into delicious song live laugh cries the chiff-chaff all day long careless of elaboration if he can give his message effectually cutting the silence with his two small notes like silver shears the tom tit with characteristic egotism shouts me 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 the yellow hammer and the hedge sparrow tell over their short recurring staves 
the green linnet sits erect though his body sways with music the notes come slipping through the leaves like rain and sometimes he throws back his head and laughs the cheery babble of starlings fills any pauses and the lark mercury of spring goes on skyed messages then one morning you wake to a consciousness of something more across the lighter singing strikes the borden notes of the cuckoo expressing the cosmos for himself in two syllables saying the same thing as cuckoos were saying when watling street was made of which we long to know the interpretation the willow wrens begin their ethereal whisperings the black cap comes he is the meister singer of gardens where the nightingale is absent in a moment as you stand by the willow where he is he opens the doors of delight his swift winning phrases go lilting up and down in continuous sweetness for an hour at a time then suddenly there are the swallows clinging to the eaves and to branches over water chattering with lovely monotony singing long songs that pass and come again low serene contemplative so all day between dusk and dusk there is music and even in the dark the sedge warbler wakes and sings while night pales towards the dawn you can hear him down in the dim trees by the water his tenuous notes are scarcely strong enough to pierce even the silence but to sleepless people weary of the night his song is comfortable they love him for singing his lonely small roundelay not waiting for the chorus or the sun multitudes of soft sounds make up the music of spring a gentle stir of growth the crisp rustle of daffodils against one another the wind communing with young leaves and the air is full of plaintive voices of small creatures questioning of life as the grass grows deep and june slips by the birds sing only in the cool and the burden of the music is taken up by the trees and the fields when the ear is attuned to this fainter singing it hears in each tree a different voice sighing discoursing laughing oak leaves on their firm stiff stems brush one another roughly long pendant willow leaves move with a sleepy whisper chestnut leaves lip one another consolingly aspens and poplars have their leaves hung loosely on stalks almost as flexible as the veins they are soft and thick so the mere hint of a breeze sets them twisting round to talk together the continual motion sounds like running water and in quiet places you can hear it across a wide field the wind fans in the maple harps in the needles of a pine sighs in silver birches and rolls like an organ in the cedar the other chief singer of summer is the grass it is the very voice of earth taking us into her confidence to hear it you must go to some upland away from water and trees and lie with the green forest above you then you will hear the silky ripple of the blades and the velvet caress of the ripe brown grass heads swelling to a multitudinous soft whisper as the breeze goes by these murmurs the hum of bees in the clover the shrilling of crickets charm and possess the silent noon falling into a dream you will suddenly be startled by a resonant imperious voice close by shouting in a strange language rising on your elbow mystified you will see a small dark bird running away among the grass and for once you will have heard the corncrake as the little people of the fields hear him of all summer music there is nothing more contented than the sound of a herd cropping cool grass in the shade it is as refreshing to hear as running water when the cows come farmwards at milking time with the unyoked horses a harmonious tumult rises filling the warm silence as syllabub fills a bowl 
among all these gentle melodies there breaks out the occasional forceful bass of a thunderstorm with rushes of rain and an eerie wind which passes furtively in the treetops just before autumn the oat fields begin their dry throated song louder than that of the grass and heavier grains keep time with fairy castanets sounds of reaping begin to haunt the air the prelude of autumn has begun on still september mornings when a sweet warm wind blows under the grey sky sounds carry far the bleating of sheep calls from far-off fields the sharp trot of a horse on a hard road the hum of threshing the rooks fly in long black threads across the uplands to the stubble fields and the sense of tranquillity is deepened by their erratic cawing some of the harshest tones of nature bring the deepest rest few things are so unmusical as the voices of rooks yet a home with a rookery is a very peaceful place perhaps the continual cawing like the ticking of a clock in a quiet room emphasizes the surrounding hush perhaps it is the association of childhood and calm days or is it something deep and old as earth that lurks in the harsh voices and comes poignantly to our hearts hear them on a windless evening winging homeward heavily through the rain with desultory cawing listen as they settle clamorously for the night and you will know how well they filled the pauses made by departing sweetness autumn is full of leave-taking in september the swallows are chattering of destination and departure like a crowd of tourists and soon they are gone gone also are the willow wrens and the blackcaps and the reed sparrows and the cuckoo has long been part of the echoing past it is the day of small things the wren's bell-like note and the wild little song of the tits are quite impressive now the robin is chief singer his voice ascends like a spiral stair every ringing note a roundel for the mounting spirit down through the sear leaves comes the first chestnut others follow in quickening commotion beginning their long pilgrimage to perfection a hundred years hence they will stand in bridal white against the blue then the complaint of falling leaves begins swells in ghostly crescendo and is hushed once more as in early spring the air is full of wings missile thrushes field fairs and red poles are busy in the ploughlands great gatherings of starlings assemble in the afternoon to go to roost in the reeds when thousands of them rise together there is a sound like the unfurling of a silken banner flocks of wild geese pass over and their strange cry falls from the sky the peewits wheel and call continually and from amid the ripple of their wings their cry sounds lost and lovely as some naiad's voice beneath running water now the four winds stand up to sing their winter song the melancholy south the east inarticulate with mist the wild west and the sonorous north with its half audible sigh of snow their strong masculine voices harmonize perfectly with the severe outline of winter the thud of snow from creaking pine branches the cracking of ice on the meres the reverberating fall of rocks split by the black frost on the hilltop the shivering whimper of owls these are the crude notes of the dark months so the year's music draws to a close which means a new beginning in listening to it there is never the unrest that one feels in hearing a beautiful song the sorrow of knowing that it will soon be over nature's music is never over her silences are pauses not conclusions they emphasize the music it is between thunderclaps when the reverberations have sunk into tense stillness that you realize the thunder when you lean from your window into the silence of a country night 
you are not aware of it at first it is like an invisible enclosing bowl and you become aware of its depth only when a fox's bark rings in it like a sharp silver thing striking the sides once and yet again or when the song of a willow wren patters into it in a succession of liquid notes few things bring such healing to a worn spirit as this silence which falls softly layer upon layer on the jaded mind like blossoms on a rough cart track music expresses the other delights of nature and is intensified by them so the calling of cuckoos completes the beauty of the grass fields racing shadows depths of green powdered with daisies the scent of vernal grass are all taken up into the haunting cry so the blackbird gives to all the silent breaths and pulses of april a voice and they give him a setting for his song when the witch elm sprays are crimson rosaries set and ordered without fingers when the pear trees are hung with bright little globes that shine like raindrops and are indeed drops from the great storm of life that is sweeping over all things then the rhapsody of a blackbird says for us all the things that we feel his is a magic melody sweeter even than the singing of those wondrous birds of rhiannon whose song was at a great distance over the sea yet appeared as distinct as if they were close by and fourscore years passed as a day in listening to them and there was no remembrance of sorrow whatsoever in every field are more magical songs than these fourscore aprils seem a very little time to spend in listening and while you are in the charmed circle though your eyes may be full of tears there is no remembrance of sorrow at all sometimes when the music of earth is most arresting we seem to hear through it an unknown personality far off in the terror of great beauty summoning us poor wanderers in tones reassuring as a herdsman's call to his cattle on the mountains simple and homely end of chapter two part two chapter two part three of the spring of joy by mary webb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian joy part three the joy of fragrance chests of fragrant medicinal balm to work cool ointments for the grieved flesh charles wells as the colour-blind slowly learn to distinguish shades of blue and green so the scent-clogged may explore the almost unknown delights of fragrance until they can disentangle the ravelled sweetness in the air we know by the colour of her burden under what friendly roof the bee asked alms this morning whether she begged in the brown hut of the figwort or the rosy pavilion of the willow herb so when the wind comes along secret ways with the laugh of a naughty child who has found a treasure and will not tell of it we know where he has been by the scents that cling to him like burrs to a truant lad here are the sharpness of bilberry leaves the emanations of moss the reek of a blue spired bonfire the resin of sticky poplar buds the metheglin of white violets and somewhere among them lingers the keenness of sprays from the home of sea mews sometimes when the east wind is full of meditative savagery one almost fancies that a hot odour may have travelled in its caravan from the heart of china bringing us a message from the spice trees of kwang tung as in some uncanny flowers and distorted trees there seems to be an evil influence so in many cloying scents there is sorcery down where the pale turf is dank 
among the harsh smells of yew trees laurels and herb paris one almost sees the malevolent fair face of vivian as she passes delicate and dishevelled among the tangled shadows weaving incantations with her wimple crush the purple orchis or berries of black bryony and their necromancy brings dim thoughts of evil schemings dishonoured deaths unholy rites then gather a spray of wild artemisia its sweet influence will exercise the sense of brooding harm it brings remembrance of well-being and well-doing of love triumphant and dreams come true when the honeyed wine of apple blossom is in the air and the freshness of dew is like a caress we hear the youth of the world laughing we see perdita with her arms full of daffodils and atalanta coming through the meadow with wet white feet these immemorial essences fill the mind with purple haze and auroral mist conjuring impalpable visions of ancient things the origin of flower scents is full of mystery sometimes they seem to run through the minute veins like an ichor as in wallflowers with their scented petals sometimes they are locked in the pollen casket or brim the nectar cup sometimes they come from the leaf pores as in balm and sometimes from the roots in addition as in primroses and lilies the essence lies in the arms of that small creature the seed who seldom tells her secret flowers like the oxlip with transparently thin petals only faintly washed with colour yet have a distinct and pervasive scent daisies are redolent of babyhood and whiteness wood anemones lady smocks bird's foot trefoil and other frail flowers will permeate a room with their fresh breath in some deep lane one is suddenly pierced to the heart by the sweetness of woodruff inhabitant of hidden places shining like a little lamp on a table of green leaves it is like heliotrope and new-mown hay with something wholly individual as well to stand still letting cheek and heart be gently buffeted by the purity is to be shriven the violet has long had such poor negative virtues as modesty and self-effacement ascribe to her because she stays in her hidden nook apparently a very humble and unknown little creature but from her quiet haunt she sends forth her fragrance like a voice into the world the expression of a soul so rich that it cannot be contained within her narrow dwelling she impresses it upon the gale the wind becomes her henchman and carries it upon his shoulders then such as love violets travel up the strengthening sweetness and find this sleeping beauty in her fastness tearing their hands and healing their hearts so she finds her worshippers her lovers many common flowers have the graciousness of personality that some rare women have agrimony is one of these walking along a dusty highway in july one becomes aware that every breath is a blessing from some wayside flower and tracing the resinous sweetness as it freshens through the dust finds the hitherto unnoticed spike of little yellow stars those who go by a wood in may are enfolded in a wave of delight and whispering wild hyacinths feel as if a child has kissed them fragrance is the voice of inanimate things the air is full of the cries of leaves and grass softer than those of the flowers in the dark night of the cedar there is a different atmosphere from that within the dusk of beeches or of the green gloom of april larch woods sometimes in places where there are no flowers aromas dart upon one like little elves with sharp teeth from corn and fir cones damp soil and toadstools keen grass and pungent bracken 
even rock sends out a curious redolence in hot weather which unites with dried ling and herbs to form an undercurrent to the mellowness of gorse down by a stream at dusk the water takes up into its freshness the breath of mallow pennyroyal and willow herb as they sway in their sleep in a shower unsuspected sweets rush out of ambush with a laugh overpowering and imprisoning us in the dewy summer dark clover and night flowering stock conspire with the campion and sleepless honeysuckle to invade the drenched gardener and to conquer and possess the dreaming house often in winter across leagues of snow a mysterious fragrance comes inexplicable until we remember that snow itself has a faint emanation and that the essence of pines of last year's hay and far-off violets can wander across the pure air for long distances treasured like wine in a crystal glass by the frost is anyone sickened by the sordidness of life let him go to the tents of flowering trees when the cavalcade of the wild bee comes to the apple as the arabs to mecca when the spinneys are fresh with quicken and the fly hovers like a lover outside the shut door of the pear blossom and waits till the red cross of denial that marks the bud is changed to the yellow pollen wreath of fulfilment the fragrance of limes when every honey dipping tassel has its clinging bee is like the hail of a friend the poignancy of it and the deep note of the bees weave themselves into a circumambient peace within which each tree dwells like saturn in his rings it is fainter in the outer precincts deepening to such a breathless delight as one penetrates to the centre that it is difficult to remember which sense is in touch with the voice of the bees and which with the voice of the tree a little wood i know has in may among its oaks and beeches many white pillars of guian trees each with its own air round it at long intervals a large soft flower wanders down vaguely honeyed mixing its breath with the savour of sphagnum moss and resting among the wood sorrel the wood pigeons speak of love together in their deep voices unashamed too sensuous to be anything but pure among the enchanted pillars on the carpet of pale sorrel with a single flower cool in the hand one is in the very throne room of white light a little farther on the air is musky from the crowded minarets of the horse chestnut white marble splashed with rose where the bumblebee drones insects are the artists of fragrance they have a genius for it there seems to be some affinity between the tenuity of their being and this most refined of the sense impressions ghostly calls summon them to their banquets the crane's bill has a word for the gnat the helleborine fills her goblet only for the wasp the yellow iris calls to the honey-fly the meadow saffron's veined cup is for the bee moths call each other by scent so do bees and probably the smallest ephemera follow the same law these calls and answers cross the world continually like a web of fine threads most of them too slight for our comprehension nature spreads her sweets for the poor she gives them rosemary instead of sandal buds wild cassia instead of cinnamon iris roots and ploughman's spikenard for those who cannot buy attar of roses the nectar of full hives warm wax dry leaves ripening apples these are her commonplaces the very beetle climbing a rough willow is redolent of flowers on the darkest day of the year with sleet in the air you can find in the sombre shelter of a yew tree a pale blossom scented like heliotrope it is only the wild butterbur yet its delicacy lifts the wintry day on to the steps of summer 
among the most desolate sand hills you may find in july acres of wax-white pyrola like lilies of the valley splashed with pink covering the plains between the long ridges of harsh grey grass the forlorn sigh of the grass is drowned by the humming of bees over the glistening carpet and from every flower rises an intense fragrance the whole earth is a thurible heaped with incense a fire with the divine yet not consumed this is the most spiritual of earth's joys too subtle for analysis mysteriously connected with light and with whiteness for white flowers are sweetest yet it penetrates the physical being to its depths here is a symbol of the material value of spiritual things if we washed our souls in these healing perfumes as often as we wash our hands our lives would be infinitely more wholesome the old herbalists were wise in their simplicity in the making of marigold potions medicaments of herbs soothing unguents from meliot and musk mallow elecampane and agrimony pillows for the sick from rosemary and basil beech leaf mattresses for the weary for these things cleanse the whole being golden saxifrage for melancholy blue vervain for working magic cures said the old physicians and still the shining saxifrage shames the discontented and the rare blue vervain diffuses magic the pasque flower dark purple sun-hearted with its symbolism of the old grief and the young joy that the christian mystic puts into the word easter was given for cataract it cures a darkness worse than that of the eyes the arabs give a fusion of roses for tisis the aconite under her cold slaty roof keeps a simple for fevers from the pink cistus with its heart of five flames comes the merciful labdanum such things are a cordial for body and soul a thousand homely plants send out their oils and resins from the still places where they are in touch with vast forces to heal men of their foulness they link the places that humanity has made so chokingly dusty with the life-giving airs of the ambrosial meadows bringing women's heads round quickly and setting people smiling not once only but every year the fair young body of the wild rose hangs upon the thorn redeeming us through wonder and crying across the fetid haunts of the money-grubbers with volatile sweetness father they know not what they do End of chapter 2, part 3「Laughter」Come live and be merry and join with me to sing the sweet chorus of ha ha he William Blake there is a path that leads from every one's door into the country of young laughter but you must stoop to find it the branches laugh and sigh above willow herb and traveller's joy cover you with their soft fleeces fennel and flowering mint make the air spicy the burdock and the bedstraw stretch out their hands to catch you there the birds sit so erectly prim and so silently mirthful that you often have to clap your hand over your mouth like a child in case your echoing laughter should disturb the place when you have gone a little way the path may end without warning in a rabbit burrow or the dome of a mole's winter palace or the hanging cradle of a long-tailed tit then back you must go and begin again 
only to come to a standstill soon before the frail barrier of a spider's web swung from opposite thorn trees nothing must be broken here or you will find yourself left in a grey world with all the irresponsible gaiety of the enchanted pathway folded in stiff sadness like a dead moth's wing the first time i went there was in may across the way hung a hollow ivy bush through which ran a long branch of wild apple inside the bush absurdly crowded together halfway along the bough were six very young and very small long-tailed tits how they could be out in the world at all was amazing they were not in the least dismayed they gazed at me unblinkingly in the dignity of their long tails with unruffled equanimity suddenly it seemed to me that those minute balls of fluff were my self-constituted judges i was constrained to whisper very softly for fear of frightening them not guilty my lords then i fled up the path to have my laugh out and returned in a little while to find the court empty their lordships having adjourned in some miraculous manner they had been spirited away by their parents and i could never find them again so the verdict remains unknown to me later in the year i went farther down the path to a place where a crowd of young bullfinches were eating dandelion seeds they hung on to the flower heads in an incompetent way like inexperienced and rather stout trapeze performers and the elastic stalks bent with them so that they bobbed up and down continually with their energy beside a gate from which a lamb with a musical forehead and a stentorian voice observed them some young chaffinches and greenfinches were playing in a minute pool of rainwater left from a thunderstorm the idea had just come to them that they must wash so in they fluttered and flicked a few drops over their chests they were so like children paddling that i said children children wet your foreheads and immediately the air was full of little wings and flying drops of water looking back i saw them sitting gravely along a low larch bough cogitating they were wondering about the new sound in their quiet world and as they are rather slow-witted little birds very likely they are wondering still are these things childish then it is good to be childish there is something in the atmosphere of the fennel path that purifies the heart on a certain day in autumn when the herbs on either side were more pungently sweet because a frost had touched them when the first winter violets appeared among its fresh leaves a young thrush stirred by some fragrance as of spring in the warm day instinctively began to sing but he did not know a song he reasoned with himself doubtfully tentatively among the golden columns of the trees that upheld the low grey sky but no inspiration came to him he was unready as yet for his true song sure unwavering recklessly glad there was sadness in the mellow morning pathos in the low notes because the trees must feel weights of snow and the thrush taste the bitterness of winter before the young leaves and the ecstatic song could spring up together into the light on a chestnut bough already bare a young blackbird was shouting a stave he had probably remembered quite suddenly the golden roundelay his father sang when he was only a quick breathing bundle in the nest with the touching hopefulness and arrogance of youth he thought he could sing it then and there so he rushed into self-expression and produced something faintly resembling the full round call but with a very humiliating rasp at the end misgiving crept into his soul but he was determined he went on and his sisters humbly perched upon a lower bough listened with rapt admiration 
for they poor things could not sing a note the same quaint mixture of a laugh and a sigh comes when you hear a starling at his orisons it is such a funny little hymn and it trails off so queerly into a kind of i wonder whatever i can say next but he sings with uplifted head and quick spreadings of his wings and though he is ludicrous his earnestness is lovable his song is not much but it is his best one winter day the path led me to a hall of pine trunks where i watched a nuthatch go up an aspen tree he was a solemn bird he had a look of concealed scorn when his eye rested on anything that was not a nuthatch i sat down to see which of us would be obliged to give way to merriment first and the nuthatch won he went on laboriously creeping round and round tapping absorbedly looking down occasionally as if to see whether i had been dazzled by his shining example and was also beginning to creep and tap he did not care whether i laughed or not he simply hammered i longed to ask him whether he agreed with the maxim that genius is the infinite capacity for taking pains but of course he does equally persevering is the dipper with his knee strengthening exercises were we dippers we think having the freedom of those translucent green waterways we would not stand on a hot stone exercising for half the day yet the dipper is very like some of us so is the bumblebee paying a house-to-house -house visitation among the nasturtiums saying in her thick voice most important help urgently needed hunger in the nest great mortality among the young bees as she goes off laden one is almost sure that a demure ripple of laughter passes over the arch nasturtiums the robin revelling in detail chirping platitudinously is polonius to the life as he surveys you head awry you hear that he is mad tis true tis true tis pity and pity tis tis true he has just the lisp to say it well this is only in the summer later he gets him a soul and a song the sparrow like all street singers sounds his scrannel note with raucous complacency but it does not matter here for no one is critical or talks of art once on a july morning i ran through the cornflower blue shadows of the path to a grove of young fir trees and was present at a breakfast party given by the willow warblers a good many chiffchaffs and wood wrens were there they seemed to be vivaciously discussing last winter's african adventures they had invited the tomtits poor things one can imagine them saying they are so provincial it will widen their minds the conversation being so cosmopolitan the tits were rather quiet and ruffled of crest after about an hour the warblers began to sing the tomtits helping making up for the fewness of their notes by shouting at the tops of their voices it must have been a kind of grace for afterwards they all flew away some ducks in a pond close by were cackling with laughter down went their heads among the water lilies and every time they righted themselves they shrieked again in the centre sat one duck who neither dived nor shouted but quacked monotonously as if she were saying oh my sisters life is very solemn through all her utterances the others continued to stand on their heads and shriek hysterically as if they knew that her killjoy attitude was not really high principle but adipose deposit farther on in a still hot place a company of red admiral butterflies drank sap on a big tree trunk and a peacock butterfly was resting fanning her wings often 
I have walked in the fennel path all day, watching the gay life there, where the birds sit each in the midst of song, and the squirrel indulges in graceful buffoonery. In the ploughlands on either side, the plovers gravely go through their one trick every year, tempting the pursuer from their nest with mock fear and inward satisfaction. There, the inconsequent stream that runs beside the path, bearing its millions of white lights like silver leaves, always passing, never gone, says such inimitably witty things that even the thin, old maidish reeds are bent double with laughter, though they whisper, hush, 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 for propriety's sake. There the termagant wind comes hurtling, roaring with rough good-humoured merriment, when the long-tailed tits, with all their dignity gone, and their tails blown over their heads, look like balls of wool with a knitting needle stuck in at an acute angle. There in June the cuckoo pint plays a game of her own invention with the inquiring, greedy little flies who come to see her because she keeps a good table. She lets them all in, opening the door and disclosing a dainty repast. When they are inside, clap goes the door, a shower of pollen falls over back and wings, and there they have to stay at her pleasure. But she lets them go in an hour or two. In spring, if you brush a branch aside, you find it weighted with a burden of life. At some junction of the branches nestles the round home, full to overflowing of panting, vociferous, helpless youth. The warm little bodies, the eager beaks, opening with one impulse in the enthusiastic hope that food is coming. The crude yet sweet young voices, the delicious surprise of these, never grows dull. The path is full of white butterflies that have risen from flowery fields beyond the sea, lighting with a flicker of wings on the rigging of some yacht, and so coming across at their ease. There the queen bee with her strange low piping, a mere breath of sound, but stirring the same frenzy as bagpipes played softly before a battle, wakens madness in her followers, and lures them through the gates of adventure, as Ned Pew's fiddle inveigled folk through the gates of fairy. There, in winter, you can find little caterpillars huddled together in a silk marquee, at which they have all toiled like good communists. In summer, the peddler's basket, a saxifrage, shows her gay wares and ribbons of red stalk. The mullains, the high tappers of the Saxons, burn pale yellow on each side of the path. But when the moon goes behind a cloud, they suddenly extinguish their torches, leaving us to play catch-as-catch-can with the teasels in the dark. When the enchanter's nightshade shone palely along the way, and the moonlight barred it with black and silver, I went tiptoe upon the seeding moss to look for little owls. Over the path stretched a polished beech bough. Behind it, like an enormous lemon, hung the moon. Upon it, still and silent and inimitably grave, were two baby owls taking an airing. They stared at me, not because I was interesting, they made me feel that, but because I was there. The four eyes were focused like cameras in a certain direction, and anything that came within the line of vision was necessarily taken in by them. One waited with the concentrated longing of the photographer for the little click of release. It never came, and I realized that this was to be an endless exposure. Their double stare awed me like the gaze of a thought reader. It was perfectly useless to stare back, because it was obvious that they could go on like that interminably. I walked round the tree, but as I went, 
the two heads came round also with one effortless movement and without the visible ruffling of a single fluffy feather over their backs the four eyes continued to gaze at me uncannily they were even more impressive now because they were facing the moon so philosophical and so old they seemed that one could not imagine them in the undignified confinement of mere eggs yet in that ridiculous position they had been only a short time ago simon stylites could not have ignored earth and gazed into space with more abstraction than they a long weird cry came creeping through the wood soon the soft swooping wings of the mother owl would bring her down the moonlight at the cry i was sure that a slightly interested look dawned in the four eyes it passed instantaneously and the stare was cold on me again then they began to snore this was too much knowing their pertinacity i was sure that they would not stop until they were fed good night methuselahs i said dropping them a curtsy and ran down the glade silently laughing and questioning of the look of interest ever since the remembrance of those aloof babies has been a wizard's one to conjure laughter in just the same solemn way young swallows stare at you over the side of their nest when they have reached the boiling over stage and can see the world perhaps the solemnity is a disguise wagtails are easier to understand their comedy being cruder they rush furiously over soft mud apparently no one wins the race but all return with the air of victors jerking their tails swifts are not subtle either they wheel and scream until they become hysterical and forget all decorum in their mad games olympia caricatured in the stadium of the air if we love the creatures of earth who are so gaily irresponsible so full of zest we shall share with them the large-hearted merriment of comradeship and find that the blessing of the helpless is the key to unlock the world in laughing wholeheartedly a man must attain a certain freedom from selfishness a certain purity and the greatest saints are the merriest hearted people down that path of rosy mint and astringent fennel the laughter is like gerald's cynical a thing to make whole and sound all inward hurts and outward wounds for love is health to the innermost being and every time we laugh there love deepens lately i went where the track leads across stepping stones to the gleaming water meadows ladies smocks were nodding down the way shining faintly spirit-like and gay in their lingering euthanasia great moths flapped up in the silver dew streaked and dappled with ash grey and cadmium and small ones came by continually palpitating down the dusk but by an older was one that neither flapped nor flew he simply held his wings straight out and rotated on his own axis as a dervish dances as he ascended mysteriously in the dark he seemed to be whimsically pointing out to the others who flew so madly from field to copse and back again that for all the good they did they might just as well spin in one place he was the ghost swift and he turned stilly with the ethereal grace above one spot because somewhere in the dark grass on the wet blade hung his mate unseen except by him to her warm golden in the chilly evening he would speed like a falling star when he had won her by his grace and his glimmering armour 
After a while I came to a great gnarled hawthorn hedge, cloudy with blossom and tinged with pink, for flowering time was nearly over. Within its precincts dwelt intense sweetness, and there I stayed, looking into the next field through an interstice of the twisty branches. The young rabbits were out under the moon, wild with excitement, the very soul of gaiety. They were washing their faces, dashing off at a tangent, leaping over lakes of pale light. Parents, grandparents and great-grandparents were there, frisking with abandon in the athletic manner of Dickens's old folk at Christmas. Off went a stripling, bounding over a lake, landing in the middle, dashing away with a delighted kick, as if he said, Ha! Only moonshine water! A grandfather, watching as he trimmed his whiskers, was fired to do likewise, gleefully beating the record. What is that stir in the grass at the root of the thorn? A grave hedgehog slips out and watches in a superior manner. Suddenly she becomes infected with the revelry and rushes away at a surprising pace to share the general energy of enjoyment. Behind her come four minute hedgehogs, replicas of their mother, except that their spines are nearly white and their ears hang down. Like her, they run in the manner of toy animals upon invisible wheels. They all go at a speed one could not have believed possible, joining in the fun, recklessly negotiating the fairy rings, and their absurd little shadows follow madly after. Let us go hunting marvels down this gay path, where larch and hazel hang out their rosy flowers where green curtains of mist hide more miracles, where there are wet forget-me-nots beside the grey cloud lakes, where rainbows are, where the aspens lean against the warm west and seem to murmur of a being in whose presence we may rejoice unafraid. We are so overwhelmed in these days with our discoveries of omnipotence that we have little time for realizing the minute care allied with it. We forget that the power which sets the perihelion flaming in the sunset and calls the straying comet back from the bounds of the dark also puts the orange underwing to sleep in her chrysalis cradle, while the flower she loves best is prepared for her. Who can say which is the greater sign of creative power? the sun with its planet system swinging with governed impetus to some incalculable end, or the gold sallow catkin with its flashing system of little flies, ephemera all of them and all utterly beyond our understanding. We see nature red in tooth and claw, and so it is. But it is so much else as well. It is dewy, it is honey-sweet, it is full of the soft voices of young creatures and the reassuring tones of motherhood. Year by year, innumerable acorns under the soil take off their fustian coats and begin their long climb. Year by year, out of the mud that seems so ugly, up the green rushes comes the delicate dragonfly and sets the air on fire. End of chapter 3